at least heard about the open build service, but in case you haven't, so the open build service is the heart uh, for creating the open SUSE and the SLE distributions. It's a open, uh, it's a fully open source build server, and um, it can be uh, it can be used to create all kinds of different uh, of different artifacts. So the I think it's mostly known for being built to, uh, being used to build the uh, the OpenSUSE distributions, and that is used to build RPM packages. But it can do so much more. So it can build Debian packages. It can build packages for uh, um, for Arc Linux. It can build app images can build virtual machines of all kinds it can build vagrant boxes it can build containers and all of that more or less using the same workflow um, then one of the really nice things about the open build service is the automated rebuilds so it is a build server uh, you define uh, you define your build recipe for your for whatever you want to build, be it a uh, be it a RPM, be it a app image or a virtual machine. And in case one of your dependencies changes, your package or your uh, your binary gets rebuilt. And uh, multiple platforms. And uh, Guillaume just said it works on ARM sixty four as well, which is pretty nice. So. One of the uh, uh, one of the selling points of Visual Studio Code, at least for this project, was it's very very popular. So Visual Studio Code, I think it popped out, uh, it became a thing around 2015 ish, um, and according to the Stack Overflow uh, developer survey, it had something like a um, it had already in 2016 a market share of something like 7%. Then next year it was 24, then 30, and last year it breached the 50% mark. So in less than half a decade, uh, half uh, more than half of our, all developers are using Visual Studio Code overall, which is impressive to say the least. And one of the also niceties of uh, Visual Studio Code is um, that it has a very well-documented extension API. So in case you are already using it and you uh, and you are itching to, well, there's something missing and you want to want to extend it. Uh, this is actually not too hard to pull off. So if it's if it's feasible to be uh, to be done in the VS Code, then it's uh, it's pretty doable. As uh, the API is quite well documented, the uh, there's tutorials, there's example extensions, and there's also a relatively active community around that. So, in case you're interested in something like that, go for it. Now, I've also talked about this a little. So why Visual Studio Code? Uh, why did we choose this and uh, not start with Emacs, which I, as a, a passionate Emacs user, would have, of course, loved and preferred. But uh, we also have to be a little pragmatic here. And Visual Studio Code is extremely popular. So uh, by targeting this one first, we get, uh, we essentially reach 50% of all developers and to, to achieve a similar reach, we'd have to implement uh, this extension for, well, for every other, uh, for every other editor and we still wouldn't get the same market share. So starting with Visual Studio Code makes sense. It also makes sense from another point of view and, um, for for this, I have to maybe go on a small detour. Uh, so what makes Visual Studio Code really popular, uh, at least in my opinion, is that the initial user experience is really outstandingly good. If you open it up, it's easy to understand. It, mm, it, immediate, uh, it immediately clicks 
and um, you can get uh, you can get started really fast. And if there's something missing, uh, it will tell you what you can do. So, for instance, if you open an RPM spec file for the first time, it will tell you, "Hey, you have no syntax highlighting. Do you want to install this extension?" If you do the same thing in Emacs or VI, yeah, you uh, it will do nothing like that. So that's uh, and the advantage of of this is, if we create an extension for Visual Studio Code, while it might not be your preferred editor, uh, Visual Studio Code is simple enough to grok so that you can still use it and be decently productive, even if it might not be your thing or your absolutely preferred thing. And uh, this ties directly into the, uh, into the consistent UI and UX that Visual Studio Code provides. So this is one of the, it's one of its advantages and also one of its uh, one of its down uh, one of its weaknesses so you can't do anything really super fancy with uh, visual studio code in case you are uh, in case you are used to these really powerful uh, extensions that you get for instance for your emacs or for your um, or for vi you won't get those really um, really in uh, in VS Code because the API is limited on purpose. And by uh, that might sign, sound like a bad thing, but that's done so that you have uh, that uh, as a developer, you are forced to do this consistency. And last, uh, last but not least is the language server protocol, which is built into Visual Studio Code. So in, this is a, also one of the inven uh, inventions of the new Microsoft. Which it's a communication protocol that can be used to uh, give your uh, give your editor. So uh, let's call it Code Smart. So stuff like auto completion. What you what you see here. It's essentially a communication protocol between an editor and a language server. And the language server is uh, something that uh, is an external program that uh, analyzes your source code and the editor can query the language server and ask it, uh, hey, is this source code correct or what auto completion should I provide here and there? And the, the idea behind this is, is essentially you as an author of a language, of a pro new programming language, you just write this one language server and um, it works and uh, you don't have to implement a plugin for every single text editor. And eventually we'd like to leverage this as well for, uh, for stuff like RPM spec files or other build recipes. But... Uh, unfortunately didn't get to this part yet. Now, as, uh, as every journey, there are challenges. And in this one has been partially, partially simple, but it has been also a bit rocky from time to time. So let's, let's take a look at what the, uh, what the individual challenges were that, uh, that we faced. And the first one is uh, well was in the visuals on the Visual Studio Code side in terms of the UI. So what you can see here is a is just another screenshot of Visual Studio Code, and the issue is here: you can't really change a lot of this. So if you want to, uh, if you, uh, you you have your Visual Studio Code window, so you've got your editor with your tabs, your terminals, and your side view. And if you really want to do something that does more than adding a button, you are limited to this part. You can display output in the console, and you can add, uh, add certain types of overlays to the text editor, and you can add buttons, for instance, here and there. But that's about, that's about it. If you really want to add additional data, you have to add them in this sidebar. And so for instance, you can create a new, um, 
one of these new si sidebar views and then you can create a tree view here that looks something like this so this view shows you this is the um this is the explorer which is just your essentially your file manager um now this uh, this this image is also a little bit misleading because it show because you might say now okay well th this is not too bad I mean you have um, you got all these all these types of elements here and they have different colors and you got these icons in here and so so that's that's not too bad well actually uh, you can't influence this so you can tell Visual Studio Code hey I'd like um, maybe an icon in front of this and display this text but color you can't you can't change the color of elements you can't uh, change the text style you can't change the font um, and as i said this is uh this this is done on this is really done on purpose so that the thing looks the same everywhere uh, but it's also kind of limiting so I have I initially wanted to create uh, to create uh, a sidebar that will show you all your requests that are open against your packages and requests that have been declined to strike them out or to show them in red. Unfortunately, that's not possible. It's also not really easily doable to to for instance display a graph in the in the main window. You can do that via so-called web view views but that's relatively complicated so the ui is in this sense unfortunately rather limiting so we had to work with what we have and uh, so so far it went okay but here and there i would have liked to have a little bit more customizability um, another thing is the user experience so this is mostly we have uh, roughly two target audiences i would say and uh, i'm calling one of them the expert and the other one a beginner which um, essentially the uh, this is uh, from the point of view of packaging the idea is the expert is uh, is your distribution packager so someone who has who maintains a few dozen maybe a few even a few hundred packages or someone who reviews a ton of packages and the beginner is someone who is more of a beginner to packaging so may so probably someone who just uh, who's more of a de more developer and just uh, wants to build their project and the open build service and now for the expert the expert needs uh, needs a good overview of, uh, over a whole bunch of stuff the expert wants to see all kinds of uh, all their projects all their packages their requests and they want to access all this information relatively quickly so preferably via keyboard shortcuts and uh, all that they need access to the version control and uh, all that in a hope in a relatively streamlined experience the beginner mm, may probably doesn't uh, that doesn't care about this being all very efficient and very fast but the beginner just wants yeah just build my project and uh, don't get in my way and preferably they want something that's more simple and uh, that should be also guided and this is th this is a little bit of a challenge since um we have we have to bridge the uh, bridge these two and find something that's uh, that doesn't overload the beginner but is still useful and this has been relatively hard mostly because uh mostly because it's been uh, a lot of the ideas were done by me and I'm not a user experience expert. So in case any one of you gives this a try and finds the user experience terrible, open an issue on GitHub, please. I'd uh, definitely like to hear some feedback about that. 
Now, uh, so VS Code was one part of this. The other part is the open build service. And that has been also quite challenging in some regards. So the, the open build service has a really extensive API in case you are, you are a packager and you're using the command line OSC client, then the OSC client is communicating with, uh, with the open build service via its API. So all that you can see on, uh, all that you can see uh, what OSC does, that's all done via the API. Um, the web UI of the open build service, that one, I think that one doesn't use the API, at least not uh, not completely. So the web UI actually can do stuff that you uh, can't do as efficiently um, with the with the API. Mm. And yeah, big problem in my opinion with the API is the documentation is uh, lacking in a few regards. So there's there's some some parts are not uh, there's just information that's not been updated that's missing or that's just not super well explained. So that could that could use some help, but. Uh, on, on the other hand, what's really nice about the documentation while it use uh, about the API while it uses XML, uh, and that might be off-putting to some people, uh, the schema. Uh, so every uh, every API route has a defined schema, and so you can pretty much rely on getting uh, getting certain stuff back which is very good and that ties uh, that ties itself very well into typescript because i can just define a certain type that i'll get back from uh, from the open build service and i i get that and i can just convert that into an object in typescript that's that's actually really nice but as i said Parts could be the documentation could it could especially use tutorials how to use it since that part is not easy to uh, to extrapolate just from a documentation of the routes. Um, another thing is this is rather minor, but I think the API could use some some type of burgeoning or some type of dep uh, deprecation since there's there's few routes that are either no, not functional or that simply are discouraged from being used or that could be could be maybe improved at some point and uh, this is currently not easily possible since or in in terms of uh, changing how routes behave that's really not possible at all since if you would just change how a certain route uh, API route behaves, you would just just break everything, and that's far from ideal. And so, what uh, what you see uh, what you see in the in the wild is essentially um, that some some API providers have a slash v1 API and at some point they they start a slash v2 API and uh, uh, and then start a, and eventually deprecate the v1 and get rid of it but yeah so what's what I find very challenging on OBS is the handling of the history and uh, if you are if you have worked with OSC and uh, you've you've branched a package and uh, so you you might already know that you branch a package with osc and then you take a look at the log in the branch package and the history is just one commit there and so the the history handling with obs is kind of weird because uh, initially obs started as a build um, started as a build server and not really something which is versioned and that got that got built on top of that uh, so 
uh, you have to take into consideration that OBS is mm, it's not super old, but when it became a thing, Git already was a thing, but it was not the only thing. So that's also why the OSC command line client is not modeled after Git, because back in the day when it was conceived, Git wasn't the most popular version control system. It was SVN. And so that's why OSC is modeled after SVN rather than after Git. Um, that doesn't mean anything about the backend since uh, the uh, the how the history is handled on the build service is kind of independent of that. But history handling is kind of weird and that ties into anything that involves linking of packages. So this part is what I've been really struggling with since once you start linking packages, uh, so as an explanation, linking packages means essentially if you do an OSC branch of something, you create a so-called so package link. And that means you have your original package, let's say GCC, and you say OSC branch GCC. And now what OBS does, it creates a link in your home project to GCC. And but the 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 thing is the uh, this is not a branch like you would uh, think of a Git branch, but your changes that you make in your home project they are applied uh, on top of the revision from which you branched, but also taking into consideration the current head uh, of GCC. So in case your in case the package GCC gets updated from which you branched, your current state also changes, and that's uh, it's really suboptimal from a version control point of view because your history is not not really static and stuff can uh, and and uh, and past revisions that worked suddenly don't work anymore at some point which uh, it, it this makes sense from a build server point of view, but it's uh, kind of annoying from a version control point of view. And uh, last, uh, I found uh, OBS to be sometimes kind of slow. So I'm, uh, I'll come to that, but for, for testing, I'm running the OBS development environment. And if, if my machine is under load, then OBS can sometimes take quite some time to process requests and then tests start to fail left, right, and center because timeouts are hit, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit annoying. And also you can unfortunately uh, sometimes uh, yeah, run, run a simple denial of service against OBS by just starting a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of requests and uh, if you do that with a high enough volume you can essentially kill the whole server which is unfortunate but so well and uh, as i as i noted testing oh boy yeah this this one is um this one is to be honest really the uh, besides uh, besides uh, anything involving links on OBS, uh, testing has been really, really challenging because uh, we've been creating a user interface and testing user interfaces, that's really, really nasty. So you essentially are testing a GUI. And if you've if you've ever tried doing something like that, it's it's it usually involves a lot of hacks and uh, often doesn't work. So that's also why many um, uh, many big uh, GUI applications don't have a lot of tests for the user interface because it's just really hard to pull off. And so if you are into software development and then there's essentially two big approaches to, to testing. Uh, one is unit testing that you use to test small components of your code. And then there's integration testing, which tests the whole thing. 
And so with with unit testing, this is uh, this is in the context of a GUI that's really not that easy to do, because you have your uh, for certain parts it's simple, but for the part that displays the UI, um, this is uh, this is a bit tricky because you have your GUI toolkit and that creates some some kind of initial state and feeds your uh, feeds your program or your functions with data and your functions produce some some output that then the GUI toolkit renders and to successfully test that you have to create this initial state yourself you have to then usually also um, also create so-called mocks of certain uh, of certain functions that um, uh, that call to the GUI toolkit and then you have to verify that this actually that the result that you produce actually creates the is correct which means you have to you have to yourself check okay do I create the correct visual output um, or is the result that I uh, that I make is that going to result in the correct visuals which is uh, so so that unfortunately tends to break if the GUI toolkit in this case VS Code gets updated. Um, so in this case, integration testing is is a bit better to do, since um, we essentially want to test that the extension does the right thing, and testing the whole uh, the whole one in itself is uh, prevents all these kind of brittlenesses of uh, testing it yourself but it's still uh, it's still relatively tricky since it connects to the so this this extension is bridges visual studio code and the open build service so you need an instance of the open build service you don't want to run this against production maybe since um, software has bugs and you don't want to accidentally delete important packages or do other nasty stuff, which can happen. So for that, fortunately, the OBS team has a development environment, uh, which is just a bunch of Docker containers. And uh, we use that, which is, that's that's actually, that was relatively straightforward-ish. Um, another, bit tricky part is also the extension needs to handle secrets so it needs to you need to tell it your obs password so that it can access the api and this secret needs to be stored somewhere so this was uh, on on linux you use lib secret from for that for for from the gnome project and uh, to not mess with your locally installed lib secret uh, we've actually we have a tiny uh, a tiny C library that just is injected into the test environment by a LD preload, just so you don't um, just uh, so you don't mess up your local secret storage. And uh, last but not least, the actual tests are run uh, using an uh, extension that's called VS Code Extension Tester. So if you uh, if you remember a few slides back, I said that uh, VS Code is built on Electron. And so this thing is, it's actually just a website. There's even a web version of VS Code that runs in your browser, if uh, that's a thing you'd like. And so that means you can use all those, all those testing frameworks that exist there for website. For instance, Selenium WebDriver. And so someone from Red Hat wrote a wrapper around Selenium WebDriver. Uh, this is VS Code Extension Tester. And it allows you to interact uh, via, a, uh, via an API with VS Code itself. So if you know OpenQA, which some of you in here might, uh, it does essentially something comparable. So you tell it, hey, find this element, click on it tell me which new views pop up and so on and then uh, you can check what currently uh, which uh, editor windows are uh, windows are all open there and so on so this one this one is 
really useful. I have a few tests set up with that. Unfortunately, not as many as I'd like yet, but uh, this is in case you are interested in developing your, your own extension, this is a thing you should definitely take a look at. Well, and with that, um, I would go for the, for the live demo. Um, let me share the other window. And in case there are any questions or anything specifically you'd like to see, please speak up. Is this roughly readable? Is that good from a view? Okay. Okay, so um, what you see here is uh, is essentially the uh, what you'd get if you open the uh, extension right now. So it displays the th um, the thing itself is called the Open Build Service Connector. So if you want to give it a try, you can uh, you can just install it from the um, from the Visual Studio Code Marketplace. Uh, just search for the Open Build Service Connector. There should be an updated version from a few hours ago. This is um, what I'm currently running in here is the uh, is my development version. So it might look, um, it shouldn't actually look tiny bit differently, but uh, I, I expect that probably because I'm presenting this live, something will break. Uh, and so then I can at least attach a debugger and uh, just be a little bit embarrassed and that's it. So if you, uh, if you open the extension, you can just, uh, just activate it by clicking on the, uh, on the nice, uh, on this uh, custom OBS icon that uh, Stasiek uh, pr uh, created for, uh, for me uh, kindly. And if you open the extension and you got a, uh, and you got a OSC configuration file already uh, on your file system, and the extension will uh, will prompt you for uh, uh, whether you want to import your accounts. And so I will just trigger that manually now using a command. And uh, in uh, in your case, it would also ask you for your for your passwords. If you've um, if you've never used it before, so it will store these in the operating system key, uh, operating systems keyring. So uh, let uh, the essentially the main interaction point is the uh, are the project bookmarks. So the idea is that you that you'd add uh, you'd add bookmarks for each uh, for all the projects that you care about and that you want to interact with. So in this case, uh, you can see under bookmarks, it added two of these um, uh, two of these server icons here. So one is for the open build service, and one is for our internal one. And so I'm just going to quickly remove the internal one since we don't 
we don't need to at the moment. And what you just start out with is to create a to just bookmark a new project. And if you click this this button, you can you get an overview of every single project on on OBS. So there's there's quite many. So let's just uh, let's just pick one. Let's pick the utilities project. And then you can decide which packages of this you want to uh, you want to bookmark. You can just take all of them, but uh, I'm just going to pick one, and we'll show up under these bookmarks. And you can take a look at the files in here. Um, you can take a look at the spec file opening the tar file doesn't really make sense in this case and i think the visual studio code barfs on that so this this here this uh, is a read only view so if i try to hammer my keyboard uh this is a read only view because this is uh, the file is just pulled down from uh from obs and just displayed like that um now you might have noticed that if I select the, um, uh, if I uh, select this uh, one of the files from the JTC package, that suddenly these two views here are populated. So what these, uh, so what this one, this one shows you your current project that uh, uh, that belongs to the open uh, to the opened file. So if I would simply add another one. Let me just uh, bookmark a few other packages. I don't want a Ruby, I want so, okay. So if we open one of the patches in here, you'll see that it uh, it changes um, the current project changes to whatever belongs to the currently opened uh, to the currently opened file. And again, this is just uh, this this patch is from uh, is pulled directly from the Open Build service. Um, good. So. And then you also have this, uh, the view of the repositories. Now, this is, uh, this is a little bit of the, uh, the simplified view that you have um, of your repository. So you have here every, every repo that is configured for this, um, uh, for this package. So in this case, we got for leap and for the sleaze, and you can take a look for which which paths are defined here and for which uh, which architectures and as you can see uh, we can also also modify these but i don't want to mess with the utilities repo so i'm actually going to uh, to branch the utilities package and hope that it will finish in time. So unfortunately, connection has been today rather slow. So it might take a while. Yep, the guards of the presentation are not favorable today. Yeah, please, if you want to say something, just go ahead. Uh, if you want to say something, then please say it and don't... Um, someone just unmuted themselves. Either say something or mute yourself again, please. just joined please mute themselves uh. 
Hey. Could you could you please mute yourself? You didn't fill in your name, but Oh good lord. People. Do you know if I can somehow um force mute someone i'm afraid i'm not the admin of this uh of this place so last <sighs> we cannot because i don't think that's actually a feature in jitsi uh. oh well well i mean it's uh I'm just going to locally mute the person who's currently making a whole bunch of noise, so if they say something, I won't be able to hear them. But, uh, yeah. Okay, anyway, so uh, fortunately branching finished, um, and it asked me also to, to check it out locally. So this is now, if you go if you go to build.opensuse.org and check out this project, there should be now a new one and you can, in theory, live uh, see how I messed stuff up. up. Hmm? What do you mean you, you can't see the presentation? Do you, there's, I should be sharing a VS Code window right now. Okay, so probably, hmm, yeah, it 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 could be uh, it could be a Jitsi connection. So Jitsi, uh, uh, Jitsi relies on your uh, Jitsi has sometimes issues with um, if you are uh, if you are in an unfavorable geographical location, unfortunately. Like me, I can barely see everything because it looks like blurry cam. Yay! I know that. Uh, so, uh, okay, so I've got this, I've got the package branched, it's in my home project, so that means I can absolutely mess it up as much as I want. And I'm going to do that to show you what you can do with uh, repositories. So essentially, we got repos for everything, and we can just add uh, add new ones in case so we want to add i don't know um mega 7 so and let's also add ibm power kvm 3.1 whatever that is and as i said cool uh immediately i break stuff so um Let's just add this one. I think that should. <sighs> Sorry, not adding any repositories today. I'll take a look at this later. Um, so at least this part should, um, yeah, demo, demo effect. And apparently I don't have tests for this. I what I do have tests for is, uh, at least I think so, is uh, if you, you can simply add, uh, add architectures. So if you want to have a, uh, if you just want to add stuff in here, then, uh, okay, I'm sorry, there's something seriously broken here. Give me a second. What is going on? Why? Is the API side on OBS down? I hope not. I mean, the web UI still works. Well, it is Thursday. And uh, this is around the time that they go and deploy. Hmm. 
Hmm. I get an API reply from from OBS itself. Uh, let me just restart it. Uh, screen is still shared. Uh, okay, now it's now it works well. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Um, anyway, so you can you can simply click on the plus button there and um, just add whatever architectures you like. So this um, this all so it will it will always do that for the um, for, for the project that belongs to the currently opened file. And you can also, in the same way, just delete stuff. As you can see, so the delay that you see here, that's um, that simply it uh, updates after OBS has also updated that. So, and uh, also in a similar fashion, you can add new paths to your repository. So this will just open this search for uh, for a new for a new project. So I can just start typing in and um, select some. So let's just add some leap uh, 15.2 use standard and it will at some point pop up here. And as you can see now there's, uh, now there's also these arrows that showed up here. So you can mm, you can move the paths up and down since this actually uh, makes a difference depending on um, uh, so the the order in which the the paths uh, appear in your repository that actually makes a difference. So that's why you can you can change them via these buttons in here, and we should also be able to. Let's also now try just uh, to add a new repository from some other distributions. Yeah, and now that that part works as well. So as you can see, I've added OpenSUSE factory Z systems, and this is this this allows you to add new repositories from um, from the predefined ones that exist on the um uh that are defined by the open build service and if you don't if if you don't like it you can just uh just remove it and it will eventually disappear so also other ones can just start fragging them and then they're gone so okay so this is this is all nice this is all all server side and uh what uh, what we now can do as well is um uh, is to check out uh, to check out this package and there's a button and I ah okay so this is um, what you currently can't see is unfortunately because I'm just sharing the VS code window um, so um, ah, okay there's going to be a downtime in a few minutes I just see in the chat and uh, yeah, we are then also close to the one hour mark. Uh, so what you unfortunately currently can't see is there's a file picker popped up um, that allows me to specify a directory where I, uh, where I want to check it out into. So I've just uh, selected one. Um, Um, and uh, it checks it out and asks me if I want to open it. So I'm just going to click yes in this case. We'll open it. And now what I have here is this all still looks the same, um, but this is actually a local file. So if I do this, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, I can actually modify this. And this is uh, so as you can uh, 
So this is actually a file on my uh, on uh, in slash tmp. So let's do something in here. Um, just something really really simple. And as you can see, um, this uh, so we've we've integrated uh, this um, we've integrated the the build service into the version control. So you can you can now use this fringe indicator. You can see your diff in here. Um, save this you can do do the stuff like reverting the changes works also with additions and this also shows up in here in the source control so if you are familiar with visual studio code you'll see the source control in here that uh so all your all your files will show up in the source control. Um, one thing that's a bit unfortunate is um, with the with the source con uh, so with the source control. I think the idea behind Visual Studio Code is that you only see really the modified files in this view because now it says there's three pending changes. Um, but uh, we, we've kind of opted to also display all your existing files since most packages actually don't have that many files. And what I've, at least in for my use case, I frequently want to delete files. And here with, uh, in this view, I can simply click the remove this file button, for instance, yeah, boop. Um, and, uh, now it's also handled by the source control. So I can also simply uh, simply revert it and it's it comes back. So this should be this should be more or less integrated with the uh, with this uh, with the VS code source control as much as uh, roughly as you like it. And um, Yeah, so what you can what you can also do is you can actually build your package. So in case you want to, uh, so Visual Studio Code has these so-called tasks. So if you open the commands and say uh, run task, um, you'll see it will give you a few tasks that get contributed. And uh, in this case, you want to look for the OSC task and uh, you will get a selection. So essentially you can build, uh, you can run OSC build for every repo and every architecture combination that's out there. So I'd say OpenSUSE factory x86, um, say, uh, say just without scanning for, for the output. And then it will run OSC build inside here Ask me for my root password. And now it will build it. Should take a bit. And uh, in the meantime, we can simply do a So I've now made a really uh, super pointless change, but just to be able to do to do something. So you can now see we got the uh, the spec file showed up as changed, and if I go into the source control and click here on uh, on the file, it will open a diff view. You can see now my my build actually finished in the meantime, so this should still build. And now I'll say, okay, cool. So let's um, mm, 
can commit the changes. And what I can do is, um, so there's two options in here. One is add an entry to the change log. So what this does is it writes the .changes file, which is you, which is customary to do on, on, the, uh, on the open SUSE side of things. And as you can see, the changes file now shows up as a, um, uh, so there's a new entry from just now. And you can see there's now those two changed files and now we can just commit this. Boom. And uh, there's also a rather hidden view in here that shows you the comments of this files uh, of this of this package. So if you if you click on them, it uh, shows you. Some, it's not super useful yet, but it shows you uh, essentially the revisions that were made, who made them, when they were made, the MD5 sum and the comment message. So this is this is roughly what you'd have if you run uh osc log so if i open the terminal here i can so this is also a this is a valid osc package so osc should still uh should still be able to work with this at least i try to test uh, test for that as well um and if we take a look at osc log then you can see uh, the the view is essentially comparable to this one. Good, and um, I think the last thing that I'd like to show you is now we got um, now we got the uh, our our tiny change, uh, and if we go back to our bookmarked view in here. I can just update it and um, it should eventually show up in here as well. I was hoping it would, but it looks like I'm sorry. It looks like it's uh, it's currently taking a while to sync the um, to sync the changes back down again. So occasionally, occasionally it takes a while. But uh, what we can also do is to submit this package back again. So if you click, if you do a right click on this, oh, I see that's also not visible. <sighs> screen sharing so if you do a right click on a package uh, there's two options one is branch and the other one is submit and if i go to submit um if i just disable my webcam you'll see it created a new request so and this is a clickable link so if i click that um it will, uh, it will, I can just open that in my, in my web browser. And in this case, I then reject this, uh, reject this request because it's well garbage, but that's beside So that's just for, for demonstration purposes. Uh, and unless I have forgotten something that should be roughly uh, what the extension can currently do. So, I hope this is uh, this gave you a rough overview. Um, since I'm already nearly ten minutes over time, I don't think I should be showing you how to develop stuff. But I'm very much open to any any questions, any suggestions, ideas. If you so, if you want to give this uh, give this thing a try, go to the Visual Studio Code Marketplace, search for the Open Build Service Connector. Um, let me just... Uh...
so okay so someone is asking whether you can get this through openvsx.org i don't know i have never heard of that so um i don't know i'll have to i'll take a look at that if it's uh, if it's possible to get it from there uh, just, yeah it doesn't look to be available there if it's if it's easily uh, possible to submit it i'll i'll submit it there as well so Okay, so as I said, uh, you can search for this on the Open Build Service Connector. There's also links to GitHub, so you can find the actual code itself is under the SUSE organization open-build-service-connector. And there's also, so that's for the actual extension part. And for the front, uh, for the backend library, so it's kind of split in split two ways. We have the we have the backend library, and the uh, which is communicates with the Open Build Service API. So in case you want to have a uh, have an API wrapper for the Open Build Service API that's written in TypeScript, uh, that's uh, called Open Build Service API, all separated with um, with dashes or minuses. So since there's no one appears to be wanting to ask anything, so you did good. Thanks. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, well, I do. I do kind of have a question. Um, for it's not kind of. It is a question. Um. When you were working on it, what was the most frustrating aspect and what was the most interesting aspect? Uh, well, the, the most frustrating aspect was, to, to be frankly honest, was sometimes OBS is just dense. So that was that was relatively frustrating and also getting the um and also getting the tests to actually work was uh so it was for instance ex extremely frustrating to get some to, to get simple stuff like code coverage out of uh out of the unit tests the uh that that has been also extremely frustrating to pull off and uh, the well, and um, how, how did you formulate it? The other thing, rewarding or something like that. Rewarding works yeah. uh, or 
were interesting or the most fun? Like, what was the most positive part of the experience? Mm, so I'd say it's uh, every, every time, uh, every, every time something new, uh, I, I managed to implement something new. That was uh, so. For instance, getting the getting the version control in there. That was. Uh, that was really rewarding since that part isn't too well documented in the API and uh, getting that to work was uh, was pretty rewarding since it was eventually relatively simple but uh, getting all the bits and pieces together took uh, a bunch of testing and figuring stuff out. Yes, yeah, so Gustavo, you want to say something? Please go ahead. And you're muted, just in case you're already saying something. No, no, sorry, I just clicked the, the, the wrong thing. Ah, no problem. Just say thank you, it's a, it's a great presentation. We'll enjoy that. Ah, glad you liked it. Yeah, I have to say, this is probably the most interesting OBS integration I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm honestly a little surprised that it worked because the OBS version control doesn't exactly um, map cleanly to what everything expects a version control to do. Yeah, uh, I have to agree with that. But the, on on the other hand, the version control that uh, that VS Code expects is uh, it's pretty flexible. So VS Code hasn't doesn't really have uh, so the, the the version control integration that VS Code offers that's actually um, it's pretty flexible. So you can do a lot of stuff with that. For for instance, there's an example extension uh, from Microsoft themselves that integrates the. Uh, that integrates the uh, the built-in version control with uh, JS Fiddle, which also has some rudimentary uh, version control built in. So that that part actually works relatively well. And since uh, since VS Code has no real um, history view as you'd expect it, <laughs> there's also not really something uh, that. OBS uh, weirdnesses in terms of history handling could really break that terribly. So that part has been actually relatively trouble-free so far. That's pretty awesome. Uh... So with all that you've done so far, what would be the next thing you'd want to tackle? um for this mm, so we are um the current plan is um so there's there's still a bunch of stuff uh stuff that's not really working so for instance uh think it's what's not really very well working is if you if you have a locally checked out project uh, updating that via the extension is not that's not possible so that would be something that I'd uh, that I'd like to add uh, showing build results uh, would be would be nice uh, but we are also currently looking into uh, looking into creating something that will um, uh, to create an extension that would be uh, essentially this thing, but for our uh, for our container uh, application delivery platforms. So, um, I'd say the the next steps for this are mostly also waiting for for user input. So, it's uh, I want to present this in a f also in a few places and hopefully get some get some people get more people than currently to use it and uh, to say what works what doesn't and what they'd like to see since so far it's been mostly modeled after my workflow 
and uh, that's not really representative. So in case you want to use something like that, but would like it to be able to do something, open an issue on GitHub, please. Well, I mean, thank you for doing this. This is great. Congrats and uh, keep up the great work. Thanks. Glad you liked it. So unless there's uh, any further questions, as I said, if you like to give this a try, you can find it in the VS Code store. Uh, there should be links to the uh, to the GitHub pages. So if there's something you'd like to see, just open an issue. And uh, or if you if something breaks, you can find that through through GitHub. So thanks you all for for attending. Thanks for sticking uh, sticking here for so long. And hope you give it a try if you're uh, if this is something you could find useful. And uh, with that, thanks, and I'll sign off.